and action. Welcome back to Show and Tell. I'm Billy. Today I have a super duper special guest. Don't go away. I know you don't want to miss this one. Sydney of Squidney Knits. Be right back with her. And I'm back with the Sydney Crava. She told me how to pronounce her name right. Sydney, <laughs> welcome to Show and Tell. I can't tell you what an honor it is oh. to, to have you on my show. We've met a couple of times, once at Rhinebeck and once in New York at Vogue Knitting Live. I think that's it. But I feel like I know you because I've seen you around the interweb. So Today, we're going to hopefully do a, a little deeper dive and get to know more about your vintage life, your vintage lifestyle, and I don't know, like where it all began. Not the knitting, that's been talked about. I know you were like 14 when you learned to knit, all that. You know, people can find that elsewhere, but you've lived a lot of different places. I know you lived in New York for a while. I know you were in Maine. You've lived in Germany. Yep. Yep and Oregon currently, but are there other places that are interesting for us to know about? I I think you hit all of them. I grew up in Oregon. So um, I just, I just moved back here a, a little over a month ago, but yes, has, have spent most of my time on the East coast in the last decade or so, and a little bit of time in Germany as well. So well done. You've done your research. <laughs> <laughs> You know, my friend Irina Fiber Chats, she wanted to interview and I said, do me a favor, like, please let me because vintage and she's very kind. Both of our sons went to MIT. They were fraternity brothers. So she was very kind to say, OK, you can have a crack at her first. Um, so I see in her interview, she does a lot of homework. She knows like thoroughly. I don't usually because I think then it's not fresh. But with you, I, I cheated. I, I did a little bit of homework. Plus, I, you know, I also know some stuff about you, like that you used to work at Pearl Soho. Let's come back to that, though, because the question that I ask everyone, which is the one question that I let you know ahead of time, is in your town where you're presently living, what is someplace that if I'm a tourist there, I would not find without, like in a guidebook, it wouldn't be there. But I will only know about it because of you. So I'm hoping that this is tangentially related, knitting related, at least vintage, but there is a, essentially what is like a blockbuster that still exists in Portland and it's called Movie Madness. So just like an old video rental store, you can go and actually rent physical movies, bring them home and watch them, but it's more on the indie side or on the old film, old Hollywood side. So- um, And what format are they in? DVD, I think they also have some VHS as well, but on top of all of that, they, they have- still have those machines to-, to No, it, there are people, there are real people that you have to interact with and, and find- <laughs> No, but like in their homes, like I do still have a VHS oh. viewer, but like most people I think have gotten rid of those machines. I think, well, they definitely prioritize DVDs and Blu-rays and that sort of thing. But even in, I mean, in Portland, watching VHSs is, is sort of coming back. There are people who have that kind of older equipment. But the neat thing about this place is that they have a tremendous collection of old Hollywood costumes and memorabilia. So while you're looking for old movies, you can also see some of these pieces from the 1940s, the 1950s, even the 60s. It's so cool. Oh, so that's cool. called Movie Madness in movie Portland. Movie Madness. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. Makes me want to come to Oregon. <laughs> Our son is in California, so not too far. Not too far. Could maybe one of these days get out to the West Coast. Okay, yeah, so Pearl Soho. How long did you live in New York? I was in New York just about four years. I think a little under four years. And how quickly after you moved here did you get this gig with Pearl Soho? A month and a half, I think. 
I got in pretty quick, <laughs> but I had worked at yarn shops prior to that. So I was, I've been working in the knitting industry for about 13 years now. So I was at different yarn shops in Oregon prior to coming to New York. And so I had a good, uh, I had a good <laughs> resume already. <laughs> so did anyone famous ever come in to shop there? Yes. Yes. Yes, we had, we had a good, um, the one, we had a couple repeat customers. Katie Holmes was a repeat customer and uh, Claire Danes was a repeat. And I love Claire Danes, but I have to say that my all-time favorite uh, famous customer was Frances McDormand. And she nice. was just, she was just light as air. I didn't even like recognize her at first. But I always, you know, when people come in, I'm always, hi, welcome. And she looked right at me and was like, hi, nice to see you. And then my whole body just like, <laughs> over and started crying. I had to hide under the counter because I was crying. But she was so sweet. And um, yeah, that was a really special experience. It's one of the perks of living in New York. In all the years I've lived here, and I'm, oh, I'm embarrassed to say how long it's been because it will show my age more than my gray hair, but Susan Sarandon's kids went to the private school just across the street from me. So there were many mornings I was taking my son to school that I was exiting our building and practically ran right into her. I also saw her online at the Gap. She was right next to me. And Tim Robbins sometimes would take the kids. I would see him at the corner waiting for the light to turn. Um, F. Mary Abraham crossed my path once he asked me directions. And I was like, aren't you a famous actor? And he said to me, no, <laughs> you must have me confused with someone else. And I pulled up on my phone a picture of him and I was like, this is you, right? Like you catch them off guard. They really try a lot of them to be undercover baseball caps and leather jackets. They try and like blend in with other New Yorkers. But, you know, if you're a Hollywood fan, like you and I are, you can sort of tease them out of the crowd. Yeah. Okay. Um, for you, I know it's very much about style. So I wanted you to talk to us a little bit. I, you're going to get to showing us some sweaters, but you know, so much fun schmoozing with you first. Lifestyle. You're completely vintage lifestyle, are you? Yes, every day. So the burning question for me, and I've wanted to ask other people I know who are also 100% vintage dressers, but I've never had the courage, but I got my courage up for you. When you work out, when you're doing sports, or if you go to the beach, do you have vintage athletic wear? Well, I can't say that I work out too much. <laughs> my, I, I really love, um, I really love taking walks when, when the weather allows it, that's kind of my favorite way to just stay active. And the other thing, if I can do it is dancing. I love dancing. Um, hoping once I settle in a little bit more to get into the swing dance realm. So really even the sports that I partake in are vintage leaning and are not, I don't do any sort of high cardio what's the thing where everybody yells and does dance synchronized <laughs> aerobics, but I don't, I don't do a lot of that. So I don't need that sort of. So you don't need that wardrobe. Okay. Intensive, intensive. A bathing wardrobe. suit. Have you knit bathing suits for yourself? I have not knit a bathing suit, but all of my bathing suits are vintage. Okay. Whew. <laughs> and you, if I'm going to the beach, I might do like a play suit, you know, some like a little romper or something, but it's still, still vintage. Okay, good. I'm, I'm very relieved to hear that. A friend of mine used to be the president of the Art Deco Society of New York, and I classify her as a Luddite. She did not have a computer and the woman was running a business selling hair clips all of her inventory was stored in her brain. It took her a really long time to even want to carry a cell phone. She just wanted to be like completely vintage. So 
how do you how do you mesh like you know contemporary things like computers cell phones with the purely vintage lifestyle well I, I guess I'll first and foremost say that I am notoriously somebody who hates being on their phone. Um, I am usually admittedly terrible at getting back to text messages and I'm, I'm only good at email because it's my job now. Um, but I, I'm able to mesh the two because I, I think that I use technology, at least to my own advantage. Like I, I do really enjoy having the community aspect, the instant community and being able to chat with other people, at least in terms of Zoom and on the phone and texting and messaging and that sort of thing. And I, yeah, I, I don't, I know that it has to be a part of my life, so I kind of begrudgingly use it. I'm not somebody who devotes a lot of time to uh, getting very good at technology, <laughs> so I can do the bare minimum that I need for my job and to make things run smoothly, but you won't see me trying to learn how to type code to get a fancy font or using... <laughs> Photoshop advanced skills, that is just outside of my wheelhouse. Okay. I do all of my, all of my work for Squid School is in, is in notebooks. So I do everything by hand first before I go onto the computer. Wow. All right. We'll come back at the end and talk about your school. Um, so part and parcel to this vintage lifestyle is of course, dressing vintage. So I want to know about the mechanics of this. When you're deciding to knit a sweater, what comes first? Is it the jewelry, the earrings, or handbag, a special pair of shoes, or does the sweater come first and then you look to build around it? I would say that it's usually that the sweater or the sweater inspiration comes first. Either I'm looking at an image from the 1930s or 1940s or watching a movie that has has something or has a color palette that I really like. I think color is something that draws me in instantly. So if I'm really loving the combination of, of green and white, let's say, then I'm going to start looking for patterns where I can incorporate that color combination. Sometimes the buttons come first. <laughs> so I love, I have a ton of vintage buttons. I get harassed by my knitting best friend all the time that I will far die before I use all of my button stash. But sometimes if I find a really special button, I'll start to develop a sweater around them. So I'm curious about the buttons because I love buttons and I hardly ever knit cardigans. So I don't have a lot of call for buttons, but I interviewed a guy who's a button collector, especially Art Deco buttons, which was really fun. Um, I don't want to make you give away all your trade secrets, but if there's any tips that you could give viewers about how to find cool vintage buttons when you're out and about, that would be nice to know. Yes, I would say that it is very rare that I buy buttons online. I think it's one of those rabbit holes that you can go down forever and ever. And there's something about getting buttons in, por in person that is just so much more fun. So, and typically when they're online on Etsy or something, the sellers know what that type of button is worth, say if it's Bakelite or if it's hand painted, that sort of thing. But if you go to flea markets, if you go to antique malls, that's when you can usually get buttons at a better price and oftentimes in bulk. So I usually will pick up buttons at, at flea markets and antique, mar antique malls, excuse me, and sometimes at knitting festivals. So Rhinebeck has an amazing vintage button lady who only does, who oh, only yes. does the festival circuit. She does not sell online. And so I will usually go. And when I see that there's a good amount of vintage buttons, I will, I'll buy in bulk. So I'll get five or six 
uh, you know, little quantities of, of buttons. I try to get them as a set, as opposed to just one button here and one button there. I have bought from her too, Dusty's. She's she, amazing. She was supposed to be at VKL this year, but she was sick and I was heartbroken, not only because she was sick, but because I was counting on buying buttons. I have one project that I've pushed aside because I can't complete it until I have the buttons. Yep. There's a belt and it needs a buckle. So I'm waiting until Rhinebeck so I can hopefully catch up with her again. Let's talk about yarn. Is the yarn always vintage? No, I, so if I move my head, this here is all vintage yarn pre, let's say 1965. So I have a fair amount of vintage yarn. I actually have some down here to show and tell if we can do that now or later, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. So just a couple different ones. So I do have a decent amount of vintage yarn, but I think that I collect it more as a historian and it's going to have to be really special for me to use it in a project. So I've kind of, I, even I wait. If, even if the pattern that you're looking at says use, I can't read these labels. Like Jack Frost, for example. Yeah, it says use Jack Frost and that's the right weight of the Jack Frost and you have exactly the quantity <laughs> that that pattern is calling for. You wouldn't use that? It's just because for me, this is like, this is like my archive, right? So if I see that a pattern, let's say calls for this Jack Frost wool, which also this color, I mean, this is from the latest would be the 1950s. And like this bright, vivid lime green is just incredible. But I would use this to reference when I am going yarn shopping. So I would try to find something that's similar to the ply, similar, of course, to the weight of the yarn. And then if I can find a vintage color palette, which oftentimes I, I'm a Brooklyn Tweed fan for the rest of my life, and they have yarns that are really, really comparable to vintage yarn. So I'll use yarns that are in vintage yarns that are in my stash, in my archive, and try to find something comparable. Because it's if I use it up, then I can't easily reference it later on. And I think it's this kind of stuff is getting harder and harder to find as time goes on. And how do you find it? <laughs> uh, usually I will <laughs> go down a rabbit hole after getting a new knitting book and thinking one of the yarns is particularly exciting and I'll try to go online and find it. And then sometimes you can find it on online sellers. I actually just came back from an estate sale this weekend and found some vintage yarn. So oh. it is still something you can find in the wild, at least in the U.S., uh, it is tricky to come by, though. You have to really do some digging in your online searches, even. Cool. Okay. Uh, <laughs> vintage patterns. How large a collection of vintage patterns do you have? Mm, very large. <laughs> very large. It's growing still. It's. I think it will forever grow. Um, I have probably close to... I would say 400 books, like booklets, something along those lines. It's It's been such a blessing to work at these yarn shops and be known as that girl who likes the vintage stuff. Because very often when I worked at uh, Stash in Oregon and Pearl Soho in New York, people just knew me as the girl that liked vintage. And so they would say, oh, I'm... I'm cleaning out my mother's house, my great aunt's house, and I have all these old books. Do you want them? And I'd say, sure, kind of play roulette a little bit. Sometimes it's silly patterns from the 70s, but occasionally there are some 1930s booklets peppered in, and I've been really, really lucky that way. Well, sign me up. Anybody watching, if you are cleaning out grandma's attic, think of me. Roxanne Richardson just showed on Instagram she got a treasure trove that somebody said hey you want these no one's asked me yet come on people 
I'm always saying like, I don't have space because I live in a tiny Manhattan apartment. So I can't really stockpile. I don't know where you're keeping 400, especially with all these moves I know. out of the country. But do you have a storage facility where you keep things that's permanent while you're moving around? No, I keep them. I keep them with me. So I have them here in my new place. I have a 1950s it's I I use it as a sewing cabinet. It was just kind of a a cabinet made to store little bits and bobs, but it's on the larger side, probably twenty six inches wide or so. So I store a lot of my booklets in there, and I'm in the process of of archiving and cataloging what I have. So I have some of them. If I can scooch a little, that are more like these ones that I have, you can see them a little bit, but they're in the magazine covers. And then on the back, they have the date and archival information for me, for my personal catalog. So I'm working through that process right now. And as I get everything in those magazine cover booklets, I will probably need to expand where I'm storing them. What's your favorite period that you collect patterns for? the 1930s 30s because because this was the era where the knitting craze took off anybody who watches my lectures will be rolling their eyes right now because I talk about the 1930s all the time but it's an era especially in the U.S. where everybody was starting to knit and it was when the industry really started to boom so a lot of the patterns coming out of that era are designed by high fashion design houses, by fashion designers themselves, and are playing around with construction techniques and ways of using different yarns. And it's, I think it's the most experimental era of, of the vintage knitting world. And so I really like seeing what they were developing and, and all of the amazing patterns from it. Great. So most people watching this will know that those patterns probably were written in just one size, right? Yes. And usually it's not our size. It's right. not our contemporary milk fed size. So how, how do you get things to fit you? And I'm sure you're teaching this in your school, but you know, what one or two little tips Actually, before you answer that, like that's part A. Part B is, I'm sure you're taking many measurements. Mm -hmm. How many measurements are you taking? Shoulder to shoulder, you know, neck to the waist. I mean, do you have any idea of how many measurements you're actually capturing each time you start to knit something? Yes. So... I, for those who don't know, I run an online vintage knitting school. And part of the reason for starting that school is to show people how to do exactly this, how to measure themselves and make adjustments so that those vintage patterns that are not braided could fit any size. So all of the patterns I write for garments are based on this system of taking body measurements and multiplying that by your gauge. So in, in essence, this is basic knitter math. What we have at Squid School are measurement sheets. I believe they have 14, 14 measurements that in total, and it doesn't mean that you take 14 measurements every time you make a garment, because naturally, if you're making a sweater vest, you don't need to take your wrist circumference. So it's, it's sort of an up to 14, but I would say for every garment, you're taking about six to eight measurements. So some of those are circumference, like your waist and your bust. Others are length measurements, like the depth of your armhole, your underarm to your waist, across the upper chest, across the shoulder blades, things like that. But that is exactly what I teach people how to do. It's the... For me personally, the most challenging part of knitting in general, but specifically vintage knitting, because many of the things are so fitted. Yes. And this area up here around the face that you can't see my waist right now. So we don't really care what's happening down there a lot of the time. 
and things might be under a jacket or whatever, but you're always seeing this. And this is really hard to achieve because what's happening here, at least in my case, is incompatible with what's happening in the hip region. Not that so many vintage things come down that far, but it's a consideration, especially in a jacket or a coat or whatever. So yeah, being able to master that is really the most challenging thing that I have found in vintage knitting. Having said that, of course, I'm just dying and I'm sure everyone else is salivating. Let's see what you have brought today to show us and how well-fitting they are. <laughs> yes, well, I have a, an array of, of mostly garments. I'm primarily a garment knitter. For, for my vintage knitting school, I do include accessory patterns as well. But if we're just talking personal knitting, I will always have a garment on the needles. So I did bring the first vintage knit I ever made. It's very, it's very dear to my heart and is very um, iconic. If you followed me on Instagram, you have seen this sweater at least 20 times because to this day, I still wear it in the fall and winter, probably once every other week or so. So this is called Trimmed with Roses. It's it's pretty popular these days. Um, it was originally a pattern from 1950, but it was included in Susan Crawford's A Stitch in Time Volume 2. So Susan Crawford, our patron saint of vintage knitting, uh, puts out these books where she does essentially that grading and updates the vintage patterns. So this was one from her book. I knit it almost 11 years ago now. And it has the little button placket on the back. All of, all of the roses are intarsia. I may regret showing you the inside of my work if my ends aren't woven in. Nope, I wove them in. That's good. So you can see each each little rose is its own, was its own intarsia bobbin. So it was an, an ambitious first vintage knit, but it is still, it's still one of my very favorites. Is it part of a twin set? Yes. So there is, there is a cardigan that goes along with it. I'm, I personally don't wear a lot of twin sets. It's just, it's a little bit too bulky and I like I like a good puffy sleeve like Anne Shirley. So I'd like to show that off when I can. So that's this one. Darling, adorable. <laughs> and those are her colors that she shows it in, right? Yes. Do yes. you always do the, the colors that the pattern calls for? I almost never do the, do the colors, but this was my first one. And I got it as, I believe a Christmas gift. I got the book and all of the yarn for it. So that first one that I did was was kind of a specialty, but typically I choose my own palette. Because I did one of her sweaters. I did a fair aisle. What a pain in the <laughs> in the romp. 46 stitches to four inches, size one needle. And I didn't do the original colors, um, but I went to visit it in Shetland. It's the originals in a museum. So Amazing. yeah but the thing with colors I I also never really like to do what they propose but, oh I have you pinned so people are hearing my voice but not seeing me but oh, okay but let's roll with it because I want you to show more more and more well I have another first so I'll bring this one out uh some of you may know that I have been attending Rhinebeck every year since 2016, the Rhinebeck Sheep and Wool Festival. And since the very first year, I have been knitting full suits. So I do a garment and I do a hand knit skirt. So this was my first, oh, I'm sorry. I, no, my first year I did not do a suit. My second year I did a suit. So this is my first suit that I made for Rhinebeck in 2017. And this is a fake cardigan. It is written to be a fake cardigan, I believe from 1936. 
And it's a really interesting construction. I'll move a little closer here. So you can see there are these small cables that go along the front and the back. But then what we have here is a raglan, a bottom up raglan style, which was just coming into fashion in the 1930s. And then this front piece here, the triangular piece, this is all bound off. And then you pick up the triangle and work that as a separate piece. So it's a really interesting um, construction and big, big bishop sleeves. I remember, I remember just sweating my tuchus off that year because I think it was a warm Rhinebeck. And <laughs> I was in, I mean, this is this is Brooklyn Tweed Loft. So it's a fairly woolly wool. It is quite uh, I wouldn't say dense, but it keeps the warmth in. And then I had a full length knit wool skirt as well. So I just had sweat here <laughs> the whole time, but it's, it is still one of my, it's still one of my favorites in autumn. And, and it started off my whole, uh, operation Rhinebeck suit. So that first one was 2017. I am now working on my sixth Rhinebeck suit because Rhinebeck didn't happen in 2020. So this will be the sixth suit. I'll show a little sneak peek here. I haven't shown anybody else okay, yet. But before, have... before you move on, that sweater that you just showed us because of the voluminous sleeves and the cables, I'm imagining that took a fair amount of time to knit. Was it an extraordinary length like compared to other things you've knit? It was... It probably took me around two to three months, I would say, maybe maybe more on the two month side. The thing for me was that it was a really different construction than I was used to. At this point, I had already been knitting vintage patterns for a, a good couple years now. So I was familiar with the basic the basic construction, like something like this, the blouse behind me. But this one, because it was, there was different things going on and seams and that sort of thing. That bit took a little bit longer, but at this point in time, I can usually churn out a sweater in three weeks and maybe a little bit faster if I'm under a deadline. <laughs> what weight yarn are you using? It's not always fingering? It's usually fingering, yeah. So that's super rapid. I'd love to see you knit. You must be very fast. I uh, I will admit I am a pretty fast knitter. So I tension my yarn in a really interesting way. And I pick with my right hand. So most folks who do picking is happening with your left index finger. But what I do is I tension so that I have about an inch to an inch and a half here. And then when I start knitting, the only thing that's moving is my index finger. So I'll just kind of get going here for a second. The other thing to note is that I keep my right hand needle stationary. So this needle isn't really moving. It's this needle moving and this finger throwing the yarn. So it minimizes the amount of work that my hands are doing. And I actually learned recently that this style of knitting is very similar to how they used to knit in the Yorkshire Dales. And they were known as the terrible knitters of Dent and terrible here meaning brilliant in the 19th century because they were so fast. So, so I people with the uh, knitting belts, they keep that... <laughs> Yes, they keep one needle stationary, but you're using circulars, you're using contemporary yes. needles, not straight needles. Okay. <laughs> so I, but it's, but still the, the, the styling of how they hold the yarn and how they position the right hand needle and try to keep it stationary. It's very similar to that method. I'm so, wanting, yeah, wanting to try out a sheath sometime. Well, you can't easily knit on an airplane with one of those things because the needle <laughs> are like 14 inches yeah, yeah. And, and anybody next to you well one arm's not moving but the other arm has to do a little something I don't know <laughs> I don't know about getting that through airport security either right. 
Um, okay, we got really sidetracked. You were about to show something else. Sure. Yes. So let's see what else we have. I have another Rhinebeck suit over here. This one is probably my favorite suit. This was, I believe, 2019. So this is also a pattern from the 1930s. And this one I actually did use some vintage yarn with. So the, the white in here is from a vintage yarn palette. So that was special. And then the skirt I have here. And what's nice is that, yes, the skirt is a ton of knitting. It just is a lot of around, around, around. But if you're doing it in a single color like this, you can actually use it and pair it with other hand knits. So it makes a whole knitting ensemble for multiple different outfits, which is nice. That's a great idea. I have never knit a skirt. I'm not a skirt wear. Oh, okay. Because I'm a little hippie. And well, I'm a little cool. hippie too. And I have to say that knitted skirts are my favorite thing in wintertime. Okay. I remember <laughs> seeing one time at Rhinebeck where you had one sleeve that wasn't finished yet. That was so, I mean, come on, it was so cute. I think that was that sweater actually, but I did finish the second sleeve finally. So that's, I'm, I'm kind of known for um, stressing people out with the deadlines that I give myself for knitting. So it is very regular, especially with something like Rhinebeck and the Rhinebeck suit that I am knitting up until the wee hours of the day of Rhinebeck. I still haven't um, mastered that type of, of setting realistic goals, I guess you could say. So are you working on your next Rhinebeck sweater now? I'm working on the suit. So this was my little sneak peek here in, this is the skirt. And um, at in Squid School, we call this the noodle. So when you have the skirt that's in a different stage of pasta noodle. So right now I'm at like a fettuccine level. <laughs> that was cute. Um, so I have that, I have it started and hopefully will be done in time. We have about two months, I think, to get things done. Don't remind me. I know. I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out now I'm getting to Scotland before Rhinebeck. <clears throat> yeah. Are there more sweaters to show? I do. Um, the other sweaters that I have are a part of Squid School. So I'd love to talk a little bit about that and through some of the garments from there. Okay. Because I started Squid School in October of 2021. So we're just about to hit our two year mark. This is a whole school dedicated to knitting and studying and learning about vintage knitting. So I focus on a time period between 1860 and 1960. I put out vintage patterns every single month. So you get a pattern a month. I also do history lectures and tutorials and special worksheets. And I also am working on um, we have like a pattern archive tier where I digitize some of my personal collection that is not digitized elsewhere. And we talk about the provenance of that and those types of knitting companies. So it is really fun. I have a couple garments from it. This is probably the most, the most knit garment at Squid School. This is what we call the home front jumper. So as you can see, it is the it's the quintessential 1940s knit blouse. So it follows that, that regular construction has a little button band on the back. And the way that I design this garment is that you can put any sort of pattern on top of it. So it's sort of like a blank canvas in that way. So this sweater and this sweater are the same exact sweater. It just, depends on what you want to put on top of it. So it works to be a way that people can use their personal measurements and use their knitting math to get something that's going to fit them perfectly, but they can put 
a different 1940s pattern on top and essentially make that so that it's tailored to their body. So if they want to have reindeer up here, they want to do snowflakes, they can anything they want. Yes. Great. But it, but the basic shape of it will fit your body because you're using that measurement chart that we provide in the school. So it's a really, it's a really fun place. I also brought out what is probably my my favorite design and the one that is very dear to my heart. So this is the Maureen sweater. I'll hold that back. That's lovely. Thank you. And it has, I just love to show off these buttons. So it has like shoulder buttons to get in and has that on, on both shoulders here. Ooh. So one thing, one thing that we've done at Squid School is a photo contest where folks submitted an inspiration photo and the winner of that contest, I would make a design based off of the image. And the winner of that contest was one of our students who submitted a photo of her grandmother, I believe, in the 1930s, who was pictured wearing a blouse that she had hand knitted. And so it was this pattern. And I just studied and studied and studied the image and recreated that exact blouse. So it's it that was just a really special process to be able to honor one of our students' family members that way, and really to, by extent, honor the knitters of our past, because that's something that I really love. What a beautiful concept. Wow. I don't have any pictures of anyone in my family wearing sweaters. I have pictures. I have vintage pictures over a hundred years old, but no one's ever wearing sweaters. Yep. That's me, me too. I'm, I am the only knitter of my family. So I don't, I don't have that history myself, but when other folks come forward and talk about, you know, stories of their grandmother teaching them to knit or their aunt or their mother, or somebody in their family, I think that's really special to carry that on generationally. It was my mother who taught me to knit, but I'm, I'm pretty certain I never asked her. I didn't have the foresight to ask her while she was still alive. I would have to think that she learned from her mother. So I'm guessing that my mother's mother knit. And I would think that my father's mother, having come from Europe, from Poland, probably also knew how to knit and owned a dry goods store where she was selling, I'm sure, things like yarn. Oh, wow. um, but I never saw her knitting and I never saw anything that she might have knit. And my dad's gone too, so I can't even ask him hey, did your mother ever knit you a sweater? I never heard him mention it, but yeah, well, well. I do have vintage knitting needles. I have celluloid needles that were the first needles that I was given to knit with little turquoise celluloid. They're like little gems. Yeah, yeah, I should frame them. But other than that, um, there's no, well, I shouldn't say that. My Aunt Matilda was a knitter, but she passed away in the 60s. Mm. Oh, I have a few things, and I've shown them in other episodes of my podcast, a few things that she knit, which are incredible, which would knock your socks off. But it's not this vintage. It's 60s. So, you know, pencil skirt, very fitted, um, and something with sequins all over the place. That's oh, cool. It really belongs in a museum. Yeah, it's really incredible. Anyway, keep going. Yes, so that is, that's the Maureen sweater. So that, I think that's probably the one that I'm really, I'm really proud of. And honestly, I am fairly new to the design world. I wasn't, I had maybe designed one or two patterns on Ravelry prior to Squid School, but now I am churning out a pattern every month. So that's been a really rewarding process as well to just dive into the world of designing and being able to bring these vintage garments to folks and make them fully size inclusive. So that's just been really special as well. That's the only one that you've shown that's lace. It seems like you're more a color work knitter than lace. Have you I 
I would say I'm more color work in the sense of I like to incorporate different colors together. I do, I do really love the Fair Isle projects, but I also am somebody who often is knitting while watching a movie. So I like having movie knitting, something that's a little bit easier. So stripes, different types of, of ways to incorporate different colors. I think that that's probably my favorite. I do love dabbling in lace and dabbling in cables though as well. When you look at vintage patterns, do you see a, like a line of demarcation? Are there like an equal number of lace patterns and color work do you think, or is it more color work? It, hmm, interesting question. I would say that it depends on the era because once you enter in the World War II era and even, even arguably the Great Depression in the US, so let's say early to mid 1930s as well as the early to mid 1940s, you see a lot more color work projects coming out because they are encouraging people to use up odds and ends at home. Mm -hmm ways to incorporate those. And then it's really in, I would even say the 1950s that you get some rather elaborate, all one color sort of thing. There is of course still color work happening, but maybe to a lesser degree than those other eras. So you think lace came later on? Because oh, what I'm, what I'm yeah. wearing is a vintage pattern, I think from the thirties. Yes. No, lace has been around for since a very long time, at yeah, least yeah. the night. Yeah, in terms of sweaters, like, yeah. sure, people were knitting lace doilies or crocheting, whatever they were doing, and lace shawls, but sweaters of lace less popular in the 30s than? I would say they were popular in the 30s. They probably, so actual women's garments weren't really coming into fashion until the Edwardian era like 1905 or so. And in that era, I'm not, I can't think of a lot of lace garments for women off the bat, unless they were something to be worn as an undergarment. So possibly like the edging of a petticoat or something that's going mm -hmm. underneath layers may have some lace work. But as far as a full lace garment, something like this, that would be more into the 1930s that they're coming in more regularly. I would still argue that color work was possibly more popular. So both were coexisting, but I think you have to consider like social context as well. And so if folks are trying to pinch pennies and knit instead of buy a department store item, they probably would try to work in yarn that they already had at home. Right. Thank you. That's interesting info. Yeah, I like to do both. And I keep trying to figure out which do I prefer? Because they're both so different. And they're yeah. both so period. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, that's, I mean, that's the magical thing about the 30s, I would say, because this is that era where women's adult women's high fashion, high end garments were really the, the trend were the prize of that time. So we have so many garments coming out then, and then it gets a little bit more uh, casual in the 1940s. So there's, but there's so many to choose from, from that era, so many different styles and even, even for different occasions. So something more casual or like an evening wear style sweater was a thing in the 30s. It's just, it's a really amazing era for vintage knitting. Do you have anything that you've knit for evening? I have to think about that for a second. I have worn this to a more evening-like event. If you pair something with, like something that has the lace work, especially with a skirt, you can definitely dress it up. But I'm the thing that is coming to my mind, because I do a lot of research in the intersections of Hollywood and Hollywood celebrities and knitting from the 30s and the 40s. So there is this article that talks about Joan Crawford, who in 1938 knit this sort of boxy looking bolero to wear on top of an evening gown to an event. So it definitely was a thing, especially if Joan Crawford was 
paving the way for us. <laughs> is, she, is she one of your sheroes? I mm, style wise, I would say yes. Personality wise, probably not so much. A personality, <laughs> mommy dearest, we know about her. No. <laughs> wow. But but she was an incredible and open knitter. So there are a lot of articles about her knitting. She notoriously would knit at parties. She was knitting on and off set. She's even knitting on camera in some films because she was so well known for being this prolific knitter. So she's a really interesting person to look at in, in the knitting history side. Well, you know, I have this love of movies also. I did an episode where I just pulled out snips of people knitting in films and it's become a running joke. My husband and I belong to a movie club. We watch a different movie every week. They're not usually, well, sometimes they're old, old films, um, a lot of foreign films, but it's become a running joke that week after week, no matter what the film, no matter what the period, there's somebody in there knitting. <laughs> when you start looking for it and paying attention, yeah. um, there's a film called Columbus about, it's a Columbus, Indiana, I think. It's not Ohio. It's another Columbus somewhere else. Um, and the lead character crochets. It's, okay. a, it's a contemporary film and she's sitting there on the couch crocheting. Um, what did I see recently? Oh, um, the series with Steve Martin and Martin Short, Only Murders. In the building. Are in the building, yes. yes. Um, Tina Fey is sitting on the sofa knitting with two other women knitting beside her. So when you start looking for it, it's everywhere. It's all over the place. <laughs> well, Harry that's... Grant. And say that again? Harry Grant. Yes. In uh, Mr. Lucky. I think, yes, I think yes. Yeah, so, it for the war. Yep. And then his wife, the person who plays his wife in, I think it's Night and Day, the Cole Porter story. Mm -hmm. um, his wife, Linda, her character is knitting and Cary Grant is right beside her when he plays Cole Porter. So yeah, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's pervasive. And it's really fun to look out for if you're a movie buff. So this, this is actually an excellent segue into, I believe the last sweater I have over here, but my, my academic background is in film history. So I have my master's in film history with a focus on Hollywood and German film, especially from the twenties to the forties. But I am a huge, huge old movie buff, old movie fan and and vintage Hollywood celebrity fan. So one of the patterns that I launched this year was actually a recreation of Marilyn Monroe's sweater. Um, so this is the Monroe sweater. And if you look online and just look up Marilyn Monroe white sweater, it might even be the Wikipedia photo of Marilyn. She's wearing this sweater from a photo shoot that she had in Canada in 1953. So she did not knit the sweater, but she is seen wearing it on two different photo shoots. So I would believe that that's a sweater that she owns. It wasn't just for photograph purposes, but I, after studying it from as many angles as I could possibly find, this is the recreation of of that sweater that she wears. And it's pretty, it's pretty darn close to her original sweater. So that's something I love to do is to bring in the old Hollywood knitting and knitwear and recreate patterns that way. I saw you wearing that sweater in New York last time I saw yes. it, but I yes. had no idea of its provenance, if you will. What a great story. Do you know if the original still exists anywhere? Is it in someone's collection, a museum? I I would hope so. I don't know where it is, unfortunately. If so, and I would Wikipedia love to. Didn't, Wikipedia didn't say? No. no, it's, especially with Monroe stuff, I think that it's it's moved through so many different public and private collections. 
it's hard to pinpoint one specific item unless it's a famous, you know, like the seven year itch dress or yeah. something like gentlemen prefer blot, something like that, the iconic stuff. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of collectors paying attention to her knitwear, but she did, she was photographed in a couple different knits. Everything that I've done in my research leads me to say that she was not a knitter but she did definitely have a lot of the knitwear that would have been popular in the 1950s in her collection. Well, very, very cool. That, that's a fantastic one to have shown. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for showing all of these. They're all superb in different ways. And it's really nice that you included an array of different types of things, um, stripes, color work, lace, and then something a little with a Hollywood twist, a little more contemporary. And to know that people can get these types of patterns if they come to your school, which I highly recommend. I will put links, you'll give me whatever links I need to include so that people can find you. Um, before we wrap up, let's not neglect to mention the tattoos because I think that there's knitting related tattoo in there somewhere. Yes, I have. I have a sheep. Let's see if I can turn my arm. Oh, oh bad. Wait, so let, this... let me get a close up. Hang on a second. I'm going to turn there. So this is a Cormo sheep. This mm -hmm. is my favorite has been my favorite breed of sheep for a really long time. Um, I have had the little banner around it has been blank ever since I got it. And I finally figured out what to put in it. So hopefully that will happen in the next year or two. Um, so no teaser here. <laughs> well, so my, uh, my knitting BFF is amazing and loves to... <laughs> give me crap for the type of knitter that I am. And she calls me a menace because I am a menace to myself for deciding to, you know, knit a suit in five days or stay up all night and have these all night knit on. So I'm going to get the word menace in my little sheep tattoo. <laughs> It'll be adorable. But isn't there some something else knitting? I have one other and I don't know if I can, I'll try to get my sleeve up. But this is Jane Austen, and she's knitting with her quills. I'll stand up and there, it's a little better. So this, this image was actually originally in a Jane Austen Knits magazine that I believe Interweave put out maybe in 2011, it's quite some time ago now. But it's, I loved this combination of literary women and knitting and something that I really love which you can see also with my typewriter is I love writing and I love reading classic literature and that sort of thing so the combination of of knitting with quills and it being Jane Austen who I love was the right choice for 18 year old me <laughs> well if there's anybody watching who also has knitting related tattoos, please step forward and identify yourself because I've had this idea. Another one of my guests had a knitting tattoo and I had the idea that it would be really interesting to pull together a group of people in a Zoom situation like this to display their knitting related tattoos. That's so, so cool. I, I mean, I think it would be great, but. I don't know who those people are. They're going to have to self-identify and leave a comment, uh, leave a way for me to find you or reach out to me on Ravelry at Billy Toy or Instagram at Billy Toy. I'll put my handle on the screen somewhere. So I think, I think this is a good place to wrap up unless there's something that I neglected to ask you that you want to still like chime in. Um, you talked about the school, which was important. I'm, I'm good. I am so happy to have been able to do this and thank you for having me on. It's, it's not every day I get to showcase all my vintage knitting stuff. And it's just been an amazing journey these last few years, especially being able to turn this passion for vintage knitting into my job. I'm just, I'm so grateful to the community. I'm so 
enamored with how the community fosters, I think, a lot of encouragement and positivity with each other. That's something I've really seen at Squid School in our community groups, but it's such a wonderful community, this vintage knitting world. So to be able to do this full time is quite truthfully a dream. It's it's a dream. So well, I wish I could just reach through my screen and give you a big yeah. hug because <laughs> Those are such beautiful sentiments and it's true. You know, I've come from a corporate background where it was a little bit cutthroat and people stealing credit for my work and um, not always being so convivial. And it's true so much what you're saying. I mean, I've experienced it too, that there's a lot of warmth and, you know, what goes around comes around. And I think maybe knitters are a cut above. Maybe we're just smarter than the average bears to have recognized that, you know, if you give out the love, it comes back to you. So thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thanks for all you do in the community. Everybody will be looking out for you at Rhinebeck, I'm sure. I will be there, hopefully with a completed suit, possibly with a handkerchief covering whatever I don't finish. <laughs> Well, we look forward to that and looking forward to seeing all your future vintage knits. They're always eye candy. What can I say? Thank you so much. Mwah. Thanks, Billy. Take care. Bye. Bye.